Picture this. It's 1972, and the most technologically advanced passenger jet ever built rolls off the assembly line. It can land itself in visibility as low as 150 feet. It's quieter than anything in the sky. Pilots call it the most pleasant aircraft they've ever flown. By every engineering measure, it's superior to its competitor. And it fails spectacularly in the marketplace. This is the story of the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar, an aircraft that proved technological superiority means nothing if you can't get it to customers on time. The late 1960s sparked an aviation arms race. Boeing had just unveiled the massive 747, with a maximum theoretical capacity exceeding 400 passengers for transoceanic routes. But airlines saw a gap. They needed something smaller for medium-haul routes, something more efficient than stuffing passengers into a half-empty jumbo jet. Two manufacturers raced to fill that gap. McDonnell Douglas with the DC-10 and Lockheed with the L-1011 TriStar. Here's where the story gets interesting. Lockheed didn't just want to build another airplane. They wanted to build the perfect airplane. The TriStar featured an innovative S-duct design for its tail engine, a curved intake that, according to engineering analysis, reduced drag by 2 to 4% compared to the DC-10's conventional straight-through mounting. The DC-10 stuck its tail engine up high on a pylon, Simple and straightforward. Lockheed buried theirs inside the fuselage, rooting air through an elegant S-curve that saved weight and improved aerodynamics. The TriStar became the first wide-body certified for Category 3C Autoland, allowing operations in visibility as low as 150 feet when fog made runways invisible to pilots. The DC-10 wouldn't match that capability for a decade. The RB211 engine powering the TriStar delivered superior fuel efficiency. Design specifications show an overall pressure ratio reaching 32.3, substantially higher than the DC-10's engines at 24.3. On paper, this translated to 5 to 15% better fuel economy on comparable routes. Lockheed had engineered a masterpiece but they'd also engineered themselves into a corner. Remember those three engines? Lockheed designed the entire aircraft around one specific power plant, the Rolls-Royce RB211. The DC-10 could use engines from General Electric or Pratt & Whitney, customer's choice. The TriStar, RB211, or nothing. The S-duct intake was custom-fitted to the RB211's exact dimensions. No alternative existed. Rolls-Royce promised their engine would be ready. It featured an ambitious carbon fiber fan stage called Highfill, designed to save substantial weight over conventional titanium. During certification testing in May 1970, engineers fired a chicken into the intake at high speed, simulating a bird strike. The fan stage shattered. Rolls-Royce scrambled to develop titanium blades as a replacement. Then they discovered only one side of their titanium billets had adequate quality for aviation use. Development costs exploded to £170.3 million, nearly doubled the original estimate according to Rolls-Royce reports to the UK government. Production costs exceeded the selling price. The entire program was financially insolvent. While Lockheed waited for engines, McDonnell Douglas was building airplanes. The DC-10 flew on August 29, 1970. It entered service with American Airlines on August 5, 1971. The TriStar flew just three months later, on November 16, 1970. Seems close, right? Certification took nine months longer, not just from engine delays, but from the aircraft's complexity itself, the advanced autoland systems, novel aerodynamic solutions, and sophisticated flight controls required extensive testing that the DC-10's simpler design avoided. The TriStar finally received certification on April 14, 1972, with the first aircraft delivered to Eastern Airlines on April 26. Eastern's first revenue flight launched on April 30, 1972, nearly a full year behind the DC-10's entry into service. One year, 
that delay would prove fatal. February 4th, 1971. Rolls-Royce declares receivership. The engine manufacturer has collapsed, taking Lockheed's entire program with it. Lockheed was already hemorrhaging money from the C-5 Galaxy military transport. Cost overruns exceeding $1 billion forced the company to absorb a quarter billion dollar loss. The TriStar delays arrived at the worst possible moment. The British government nationalised Rolls-Royce to continue RB211 production. In August 1971, the US Senate voted on whether to guarantee $250 million in loans to Lockheed. The vote? 49 to 48. The measure passed by exactly one vote. Think about that. One senator's decision separated Lockheed from bankruptcy and the TriStar from oblivion. The government intervention saved the company. It couldn't save the aircraft's market position. By the time the TriStar received certification in April 1972, the DC-10 had accumulated dozens of firm orders and proven itself in daily airline operations. American Airlines fleet was already establishing the DC-10 as the industry standard. Pilots were trained on it, maintenance crews knew it, spare parts networks existed for it. Airlines ordering aircraft during the critical 1971 to 1972 window purchased approximately 400 trijets combined. The DC-10 captured the largest share before the TriStar stabilized production. The math was brutal. Based on financial projections at the time, Lockheed needed to sell approximately 420 TriStars to break even in net present value terms. Final production? 250 units. The DC-10? 446 units. TWA initially committed to 22 TriStars for 1971 to 1972 delivery. Engine unavailability forced delays and cancellations. The aircraft they bet on couldn't arrive on schedule. But here's the twist. The TriStar was genuinely better. Both aircraft cost approximately $20 million per unit in 1972 dollars. McDonnell Douglas's advantage wasn't selling cheaper airplanes, it was spending less to develop them. McDonnell Douglas leveraged proven DC-8 technologies and simpler systems, avoiding the massive research and development expenses Lockheed incurred developing novel features. The S-duct engine intake required sophisticated aerodynamic analysis and testing. The Category 3 Sea Auto Land system demanded redundant flight computers and extensive certification testing. The direct lift control system added weight and complexity. While these advanced features appealed to operators seeking cutting-edge technology, they added weight and complexity, factors that hurt fuel efficiency precisely when the industry faced energy price shocks. The 1973-1974 oil embargo compressed airline margins. Capital became scarce. Payback period calculations dominated purchasing decisions. The TriStar's superior fuel efficiency might justify its development costs over a 30-year service life. But airlines in 1973 couldn't think 30 years ahead. They needed aircraft they could afford today that would generate revenue tomorrow. The DC-10's cost-first philosophy, good enough, simpler, proven, matched the market reality better than Lockheed's technology-first approach. Safety should have mattered. The safety record tells a stark story. Turkish Airlines Flight 981 March 3, 1974, a DC-10 cargo door fails during cruise. Explosive decompression collapses the floor, severing control cables. 
all 346 people aboard die. Here's the kicker. This exact failure mode had been identified two years earlier, when American Airlines Flight 96 experienced a near-identical cargo door failure in 1972. The crew managed to land safely that time. The design flaw was known. Recommended modifications existed, but mandatory fixes were never implemented industry-wide before Turkish Airlines Flight 981. A combination of inadequate locking mechanisms and maintenance procedures, including improperly filed locking pins, created a preventable catastrophe. <sighs> American Airlines Flight 191, May 25, 1979. A DC-10 engine separates during takeoff at Chicago O'Hare due to maintenance procedure damage to the pylon mount. The aircraft rolls and crashes killing 273 people, the deadliest aviation disaster in US history. The TriStar? Its S-duct design eliminated pylon separation risk entirely. The engine was mounted inside the fuselage, not hung from external pylons that could fail. Its triple redundant systems prevented the control loss that doomed other aircraft. Pilots consistently praised the TriStar's handling. The direct lift control system made approaches precise and comfortable. The automated systems reduced workload during demanding phases of flight. None of it mattered commercially. Airlines that had purchased DC-10s faced enormous switching costs. Crew training, maintenance procedures, spare parts inventory. The DC-10's larger production volume meant robust aftermarket support and lower parts costs. Financial institutions viewed the DC-10 as more likely to retain resale value, affecting lease structures. The DC-10's safety reputation was damaged, but economic inertia proved stronger than safety concerns. Here's the irony. Both aircraft were solutions to a problem that would soon cease to exist. In the 1970s, regulations restricted twin-engine aircraft to routes within 60 minutes of suitable alternate airports. Airlines couldn't economically fly twins across the Atlantic or on long transcontinental routes. This artificial constraint created the entire market for three-engine jets. The TriStar and DC-10 competed for this regulatory-protected niche. In 1985, Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards ETOPS, changed everything. The Boeing 767 received the first 120-minute approval for transatlantic service with Transworld Airlines, though initially limited to specific conditions and one airline. The regulatory shift was gradual, but the direction was clear. By 1989, regulations extended to 180 minutes, with the first 180-minute ETOPS flight occurring that year. Twin-engine aircraft could now fly virtually any commercial route on Earth. The timing was cruel. Just as Lockheed finally solved the engine crisis and ramped up production, the regulatory goalposts shifted. The Boeing 767 777 and Airbus A330 offered superior fuel efficiency without the complexity and weight of a third engine. The trijet configuration became a solution seeking a problem that no longer existed. The TriStar entered service in 1972, precisely when this regulatory evolution began. Lockheed had bet the company on advanced technology designed for regulations that persisted for maybe 15 years. By the early 1990s, when efficient twins became widely available for long-haul routes, the exact mission the TriStar was designed for, Trijet demand evaporated. The market. Lockheed built the TriStar to serve, simply disappeared. In 1983, Lockheed ended TriStar production. The final aircraft was delivered in 1984. The 250th and last TriStar rolled out to a market that no longer needed what it offered. The program had lost an estimated 2 to $3 billion in today's dollars. 
development costs, production losses, opportunity costs of capital, workforce disruption. The company considered options, twin-engine derivatives of the TriStar airframe, regional variants, international partnerships. By 1981, development costs for a competitive twin-engine design were estimated at $1 to $2 billion, with uncertain market demand, given ETOPS evolution. Lockheed chose strategic exit. They redirected resources to defense contracting, the C-130 Hercules, military aircraft, missiles, defense electronics. The pivot proved sound. Lockheed thrived in defense markets, where technological advantages translated directly to contract wins. The 1995 merger with Martin Marietta created Lockheed Martin, an aerospace and defense powerhouse. Commercial aviation? <sighs> Left to Boeing and the emerging Airbus duopoly. The TriStar's failure teaches us something uncomfortable about markets. Excellence isn't enough. You can build the most technologically advanced product. You can solve every engineering challenge. You can deliver genuine operational advantages. None of it guarantees success. Market timing matters. Supply chain reliability matters. First mover advantage matters. Development costs matter. Regulatory environments matter. The TriStar was objectively superior to the DC-10 by nearly every technical measure. Pilots loved it. Engineers praised it. Airlines operating it achieved superior metrics. And it failed because Rolls-Royce couldn't deliver engines on time. Because development costs consumed resources that should have funded faster production ramps. Because being a year late meant surrendering the market. Because regulations changed before the aircraft could mature because learning curve dynamics favoured the early mover. 250 TriStars still served reliably for decades. Delta Airlines flew them until 2001. But commercial success requires more than building a great product. It requires building a great product at the right price, at the right time, with reliable partners for a market that will still exist when your product matures. The L-1011 TriStar was a triumph of engineering, pause, and a lesson in business reality. Sometimes, the better aircraft loses. And that's the story of how Lockheed built the best wide-body airliner of its generation and learned that excellence, in the end, wasn't enough.